Welcome along to Betting Weekly Extra Time International Edition and a massive week for six nations as they battle it out for the final three spots at Euro 2024 in Germany this summer. And there are also some prestige friendlies for bettors to get stuck into where markets have changed, given some surprising results already across the course of this break from club football. You're with myself, Dan Robert, while senior handicapper Steve Wiss is alongside me as is Spanish football journalist Rory Barlow. Steve, plenty of takeaways, I thought, uh, over the course of the international car for betters over the last few days from a betting standpoint. I, mean, I, thought was, I thought unders was going to be the play, basically. And I know that you tipped up a few overs that came in, but I thought it was going to be an unders. I thought it was going to be cautious playoff games, but I was wrong. Five of the six went over two and a half. Four of the six went over three and a half. We had goals galore, didn't we, in those Euro 2024 semi-final playoffs? Well, good day to you, Dan and uh, Rory. This is, I, I said it on the last show, a really weird international window, isn't it? I don't know whether I'm coming or going with, with picks in this window. Sometimes you watch a game and, and you're like, wow, why did I even bother getting involved in this match? Because, you know, the, the warning signs Sell it to us, Steve. Sell it to us. Well, I, you know, I've got people, <laughs> all I'm seeing on my timeline is people betting on MLS. That's about the only <laughs> league going on, isn't it, in, in the yeah. world? And people moaning about teams over there who can't score goals or whatever. So, um, but yeah, in terms of the playoffs, I generally expected a much tighter affair, really, ac across the board. There was a lot of goals scored, uh, which was, I mean, that just surprised me. It's sort of, the stakes are really high, you know, and, um, you know, it was it was a weird one, Dan. I, I can't really put my finger on it too much. I mean, the Wales, to be honest with you, deep down, the Wales under was probably my my most confident player the whole show and I was way off with that absolutely way off and um you know it certainly is a head scratching experience sometimes but maybe look maybe we're in this new era of goals it's a real goal trend isn't it the whole season so maybe it seems to be that look it's look we, mm. we've talked about it on across every single show really that the goal count is up I just didn't think it had filtered through to international football just from a friendly point of view um uh, Rory defeats for Spain for France for England uh, weren't on the cards for many betters. Lots of minus money favourites went down. Belgium were held by Ireland as well. Was it a, a dose of reality for some of those teams? And I guess I'm levelling that at England more than anyone else. Or just a <laughs> blip, do you think, when it comes to the market principles uh, for futures uh, betting for Euro 2024? Any any surprises that stuck out for you? Yeah, I thought the England one was was a bit of a surprise. I really didn't see, see Brazil winning that game. But, I mean, like... I, th I think one of the things about these windows, and as Steve was saying, it's a weird window, but it's basically there's just so many more variables involved. I mean, especially with friendlies, motivations, players playing that have more or less motivation, I think. Um, we'll maybe come on to Spain a wee bit, but that was one of the things that they pointed out a lot in the media here was that Colombia wanted that game a lot against them. Whereas Spain, and some of them were playing for their positions, some of them were making debuts, that kind of thing. But but it does it does make a big difference. And I think even with Brazil there, England, obviously, they had that unbeaten run. They wanted to continue that, and they want to continue that momentum. But probably a little bit more important for Brazil in that sense because they're in such a spiral, they're in a bit of a spin. So to not lose to England or to go and win as they ended up doing so, um, we did predict fouls. We expected them to kind of dig in, and they certainly got into Bellingham and, and made his, his night a bit tricky. So, so yeah, that, that kind of thing does pull through but you never know because England do have the better quality so if they have 20 good minutes at the start of the first half these kind of things can can swing these games especially in this window as we're saying. Uh, just a brief word on the futures we didn't really um, cover them in our first show last week so a rattle through the prices plus 300 England for Euro 2024 plus 400 for France plus 600 Germany I think they've been tweaked a little bit after that win uh, over France, Spain plus seven hundred, plus eight hundred. Portugal, Belgium plus fourteen hundred. Anything catch your eye? Anything that should be uh, bigger or shorter in your eyes, Steve? I'm not really even considering the results so far this window. I mean, there's players that have been missing on for loads of big nations. You know, let's judge it as they're heading into the tournament. See who's actually fit and ready there. And um, you know, look, it was a surprise perhaps to see some of the big nations lose, but. I think, like Rory said, it really showed who wanted the wins and who want, wanted to produce a performance, who needed a performance. Germany, everyone's been on their back, haven't they, for a while? They needed something and they got it. Brazil, you know, I think any time 
all their players put on that shirt, it means something that's prideful. Yeah, let's be honest, there's some big players in that England at the minute who are thinking of other things. And it's just them little extra percentages can make the big difference. But in terms of the outright market, no, I'm not going to get flustered over a few friendly results, Dan. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting in, isn't it? Because uh, Brazil have been pouring World Cup qualifying. Colombia didn't qualify for the last World Cup. I think, was it their first ever win over Spain, Rory? Is that the line? Yeah, I think so. And it, it was, it, there's a very good clip of the commentator for Colombia doing an obscenely long kind of goal <laughs> cry. And I'm not kidding, it goes on for about 40 <laughs> seconds. And you can hear in the background the Spanish commentators. The Spanish commentators just like, imagine if they actually won the World Cup, how long it would be then. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was impressive. And, and I think you saw that especially in the second half when the legs are a little bit tired or, or players don't want to kind of force themselves. Um, I think with Spain as well, as well especially, there's a quite a few players injured, as we mentioned, that the likes of Baena and, and Danny Vivian, uh, Alex Ramiro came in, these kind of players that are adjusting to life in, in the international scene. And and yeah, in terms of kind of those overall odds, I'm still so surprised that France are longer than England, um, I, just based on tournament pedigree and the way that England have got there, but never got over the line for, for the last 50 or so years, whereas France have got over the line a lot more recently. But other than that, yeah, it's hard to... Hard to really say whether these odds mean too much in terms of kind of the sway and the difference. Germany, I am surprised. I think we were probably a little bit too down on them and probably plus 800 was a little bit long initially. So it's probably equaling out to where it should be roughly. Yeah, European Championships this summer. Copper America, of course, this summer in the United States. And uh, shout out to my local Colombian restaurant as well, Donde Carlos on the Gold Hawk Road, <laughs> Shepherd's Bush. Um, do some fantastic food in there. Uh, let's uh, get some selections uh, for the midweek action. Uh, all the games we're previewing are on Tuesday. Uh, we have got picks in all of the three Euro 2024 uh, playoff finals. We're going to start with Path C, as we did last midweek. Georgia against Greece. This is an early kickoff, 1 p.m. Georgia plus 250, Greece plus 120, draw plus 225 here. Uh, we're into Tbilisi once again. The crowd's going to be massive as it was last week. Uh, Rory went Luxembourg, draw no bet. I thought you were terribly unlucky not to get something with this. Luxembourg did lose 2 0. I didn't think Georgia were particularly good. The crazy situation with the Luxembourg goal that was chalked off and then um, after Vara, uh, a Luxembourg player got sent off. Um, incredible uh, scenes, really. And Kavitsia Kavaratskalia is back for Georgia as well here. So there's there's lots of things to consider. How are we tackling Georgia, Greece? Yeah, as you mentioned, that kind of coin flip moment, basically, mm -hmm. where it, it would have gone 1-1 and yeah. Luxembourg would start to kind of really uh, put pressure on Georgia, but instead 2-0. Um, the second goal came very shortly after that, and that was kind of curtains for the game. But, but yeah, I think that home advantage, obviously, Kvaratskhele being back, those are the two big things that are moving in favour of Georgia here. Um, but again, I'm, I'm going to go kind of a similar line to the way I went when we were analysing the Luxembourg game, and that's that just Georgia's side just isn't that good. Um, and then Luxembourg and Greece are two completely different outfits, and even if Luxembourg have been doing well, in qualifying, Greece are a nation with a lot of pedigree, with a lot of history, obviously won the European Championships in the past. They have higher standards for themselves. And even like the way they dealt with Kazakhstan at home was very impressive. They thumped them 5-0. Kazakhstan's side that Steve was kind of thinking could even pull off a result here and, and not a bad one by any means either. So, so yeah, I, I like Greece to win this one outright plus 120, not really breaking any news there. Um, and I just think, yeah, for for a Greece side that has shown that it can perform at a better level and beat sides like Georgia quite regularly of late, um, maybe not so much in the last kind of five years, but in the last year or two, I, I don't really understand why this is so long. So I think you're you're beating the market a bit, and then maybe it's down to those kind of variables that we're discussing, the fact that it's a bit of a weird international break. But yeah, Greece, clear favourites for me, and and I don't understand why they're so long. Yeah, plus money. Uh, Steve, brief thoughts on this one. Georgia Greece view. Is it a game you looked at or not? I looked at it and um, I honestly in, initially was thinking under here because I think now the stakes really are high. I mean, Georgia have never qualified for a major tournament that I know of. Uh, Greece, when was the last time they were involved in, in a major tournament? Maybe. Mm, good question. 2014, 
perhaps something like that. It's been a while, hasn't it? I don't know. Certainly the World Cup, it's been a while. Um, but you know, obviously they've won this tournament in the past. Everyone remembers that, don't they? It was a you know a unique experience. Yeah, I mean, they they were, they were, I think there were fifty to one shots, weren't they, when they won that big push? Yeah. But... When it won nils and nil nils, didn't they? Penalties and, and what? Oh, no, it didn't even have a penalty shoot, I don't think. But um, listen, I mean, Greece surprised me in the last game. Like Ruri said, that Kazakhstan side are not too bad anymore. Uh, but, you know, look at who the manager is, Gus you know, Poye. You know, he's, I remember when he was at Leeds with Dennis Wise, he was calling the shots and he's quite a good technical manager, Gus Poye, you know. And I think that's the reason why he's, I think he's moved Greece away from their traditional sort of boring, negative one nil merchant. Territory, and that's what put put me off the unders. But really, this should be stop start. Nervous, both teams giving it absolutely everything, and it's probably going to come down to a little bit of, you know, maybe a set piece moment or something like that. Um, I think Greece probably will win. I think they're just a better overall team, aren't they? Simple as that. I mean, Georgia have got Kvaretskhelia back, which is big, but Greece can just double or treble team him, take him out of the game. So. Yeah, I, I do quite like this pick of Ruiz. I, I'm so undecided about the over under for this game. I, I don't know. I think it's going to be right on the button, on the right on the line. Uh, 2014 World Cup finals made the round of 16. Greece 2012. They made the quarterfinals of the European Championships. Don't remember that at all. No. Uh, Wales Poland uh, next for us. 3:45 Tuesday, uh, Path A final. Wales good against Finland. Um, plus 145 here, Steve. Poland plus 225 draw plus 210. Do they deserve to be money line favourites to such an extent here? I, you know, I just think, you know, Roy's just been talking about the pedigree of Greece. The pedigree of Poland historically is good. Wales have been better more recently. Um, but plus 225, that's dangling a little bit of a carrot. I don't know what the Asian line is. Um, what do you think here? What do you like here? Well, firstly, I owe an apology to Wales, don't I? Because uh, I said on the last <laughs> show that they're the most boring team that I know of, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Are you planning to, to holiday in Wales soon? Are you backtracking I've, now? I've been, I've been, I do like Wales. I must say I've been there a few times. It's a times weekend in Real years. Sun Centre, if it still exists. <laughs> yes. it still exists. Uh, a Conway Castle. Anyway, go on. But um, you know, that was probably the most exciting Wales game I've seen in a long time. It was really good football from them. They right from the first minute they're on the front foot and they um you know they got an early goal which helped. But some side, early goals don't always mean you know a match is going to explode and the team's going to continue doing that. Just look at some of the recent friendly matches where we've had goals inside 10 seconds and they're not matches haven't gone over. But Wales just kept putting their foot down, knocking on the door, you know, Finland pull one back. Another apology I need to give to Timu Puki, don't I? I called him completely done and over the hill or whatever, and he scored. So It, it was the classic uh, stick Steve up on the dressing room wall. Uh, to, to <laughs> I think both managers. teams did, didn't they? Both teams did that. So um, I got that match completely wrong. But uh, Wales were impressive. They, in the second half, they responded again, fully deserved to qualify. And I think the home crowd helped them as well. And it's going to be a rocking atmosphere. No one wants to travel to Wales in any sport, do they? Look at the Welsh rugby team down the years. It's a tough place to go. Uh, I like Wales to qualify. Wales to qualify for Euro 2024 at minus 112. I think I'd rather take this market than the 90-minute market because this, this is a sort of game that could go all the way, extra time penalties sort of thing. Um, if, if if they play like that, and Finland is a far tougher warm-up than what Estonia were for Poland. Um, Shout-out to Roy for the most unlucky loser, by the way, ever. Um, <laughs> Estonia with one shot. In the whole game, and when we're on Poland to win to nil, you can't take much from that game because Estonia were down to ten men for a long time. Poland racked up the score uh, as you'd expect them to do. Estonia are terrible, so but I think the real Poland is going to be tested here, and it's a tough environment for them. Wales actually look a really good unit. There's a great togetherness there. There's some young players who and making a real difference. You know, the likes of Williams, Johnson were really fired up in that game. I I've talked about, you know, Rodon Ampadu for Leeds this season have played really well. They just looked a really good unit. They're going to be bang up for it, crowd behind them. That That's worth something for me. And um, we've had our doubts about Poland for the last couple of years on this show. And I think maybe it finally culminates in this, being them being knocked out in the playoff round. So uh, Wales to qualify for Euro 2024 at minus 112. Done. Just a quick word 
uh, to Rory about um, Robert Lewandowski here. We had a, a nice comment on YouTube, on our YouTube uh, page. Uh, subscribe if you can. Uh, from Ponta Ponta 639, who's just talking about, he said, don't be misled by, by Lewandowski at Barcelona. At least he's got someone to pass him uh, the ball. The national team is just a frustrated, aging player with no motivation to play at all. That was his line. I mean, he played the full 90 against Estonia. They win 5 1. You think, well, well, Lewis bound to be on the score sheet, but he wasn't. He's plus 175 to score. And I started to look at his, his Barca stats. I think he had a, a slow start to the season, Rory, but he, he scored a couple recently, hasn't he? Is, is he more engaged at the minute at, at club level? Yeah, absolutely. I think Barcelona have upped the intensity. Their lack of midweek games has really helped them in recent months. And I think in terms of the training regime they're doing, they are improving and they're looking sharper. Lewandowski is looking sharper as well. There's a period of this season where about two months for Barcelona, pretty much everything went wrong that could have done. Um, they just about held on in terms of results, but in terms of play, in terms of the way that Lewandowski was playing. And now Lewandowski for Barcelona at least looks a lot more like the Lewandowski you know. But one of the crucial things that you see out of Lewandowski at Barcelona compared to the Lewandowski we've known for the decade at Bayern is that he drops off quite a lot more from the box. He tries to get involved in the play. He tries to be that link man more so than he would have done in the past where he's just trying to get on the end of things. So there, there's an aspect of that for Poland too, where they don't have the resources to get in the ball, as um, as our punter was saying, and, and fair play to him. That's a very good point to analyse. The one thing that makes me doubt, especially I think if the best parallel to draw is Wales with Gareth Bale, especially for a, a team like Scotland that I know very well, when you have these sites that are fine, they're organized, they have decent enough players in various positions, but you have that one extra bit of quality up front, that's where it really makes a difference. And, and Bale used to come through a lot. Lewandowski, not so much for Poland, but it always makes me reluctant when they're up against a side of kind of similar resources to, to back against them. But uh, especially even like Lewandowski, he did get a couple of assists in this game, or certainly um, one assist and, and worked into another. So sometimes it's not always about the goals um and, and yeah but i i do think there's certainly something in that motivation wise he's he's always got something to prove with poland because he's always had that kind of chip on his shoulder that he doesn't do it for them so so yeah it's, it's an interesting one it's uh probably one of those psychological things you could really delve into quite deeply um but uh but yeah we'll see how it goes so it goes to Lewandowski plus 175 to score at any time he's never scored against wales in three attempts Ukraine-Iceland is the final uh, playoff game we can tackle. It's path B. Uh, Ukraine minus 210, shortest price of all of the uh, finalists. Iceland are plus 670 here. The draw plus 325, obviously extra time and penalties if required. Looked like the Ukraine-Bosnia game was going to go to an extra half an hour. They left it very, very late uh, to defeat bosnia Herzegovina by two goals to one, of course, um, Iceland got the better of uh, Israel. Rory and Steve have both got plays in this one. Rory, what's your pick, first of all? Yeah, first of all, I'm going Ukraine to win plus over one and a half goals, and that gets you minus 110 back. I think, as you say, Ukraine left it really late against Bosnia, and Bosnia were better than I thought they would be, but uh, ultimately that quality just tells. I mean, Mudrik was involved in the goals. Yeremchuk came on off the bench, and you look at the resources, I think, of all of these sides in these playoffs, not many sides are bringing off a player who's kind of playing regularly and scoring goals in La Liga um, off the bench. So, so yeah, that was a, a big thing. And there's no home advantage here. And um, that's obviously a factor, but kind of a weird um, weird kind of set of playoffs for Iceland, who obviously played Israel outside of Israel too. So they're, they're playing two games in kind of weird atmospheres. But, but yeah, I mean, a similar line to where I was going with this Ukraine side in the Bosnia game, they've only lost... Uh, twice since September 2022, and that was against Italy and England. And um, you look at this Iceland side that I adore Iceland and forever will for their underdog hero achievement against England in Euro 2016. Thanks, I think it was. <laughs> um, but the ultimate underdog, 350,000 people. I just I don't see them doing it here. And um, you look at their form in recent kind of years. 14 out of their last 16 games will cash you over one and a half goals. So I think that gives you. Um, a bit of kind of reason to believe that Ukraine can score a couple times, and uh, and yeah, against Israel they won four one, but it was a late double against Israel when the game was kind of a little bit gone. 
Um, and and yeah, I just I like Ukraine to get the job done. As I said at the start of this kind of playoff round, they're the best team in these kind of uh, playoff rounds. And I think Iceland, especially if they do have to go for it, if they'll go down, they'll concede another. Uh, so the selection from Rory is Ukraine to win an over one and a half goals at minus one ten, and Rory just giving us the England uh, supporters a little bit of a, um, uh, a jive in the ribs there. Um, there's a really nice um, thing I saw on Twitter with Ollie Watkins and uh, uh, John McGinn. I don't know if you've seen this, and Ollie Watkins and John McGinn are asked about England and Scotland. And John McGinn's like, I always want England to lose every single game that they play. And Ollie, Ollie, Ollie Watkins is like, really? I want you to win. And McGinn's like, are you sure? Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's one of those weird things. I think it all depends where you're from, I think, maybe in England. And, and maybe Ollie Watkins wasn't brought up in a certain area. But yeah, there's a lot of rivalry there. This is obviously a stateside facing show. So uh, we'll allow Rory that one. Um, uh, Steve, uh, what are we like in Ukraine, Iceland? I'm smiling because I keep thinking of that Steve McLaren gag on Sky Sports <laughs> News with uh, the Iceland game. Uh, you, I'm sure you guys will have seen that. But um, yeah, brought, 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 brought some interesting memories there, Dan. But uh, Poland against, not Poland, but the L. Uh, the match is going to be played in Poland. Correct. Um, Rotswav. Yeah, I, I was doing a bit of Google Maps research for this game because I, I feel like my knowledge of Poland is not where it should be. So I was looking at whereabouts in the country this is and... Uh, it's in the sort of the southwest of the uh, southwest of the capital Warsaw, and you know I think Ukraine will have quite a few fans here. It's a neutral match, but I think they'll bring the atmosphere. Um, there was, did you know, there's a, a power station nearby called the Belichto Power Station, the biggest thermal one in, in Europe, Dan. Yeah, and um, this leads to my which, gaggy. Which, 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 which oh, go going to say we're trying to gain viewers, not lose them. But <laughs> I know. Well, I, I'm I'm hoping for an electric atmosphere, ah. um, and uh, yeah, I'll get my coat because I'm going with the goals. I'm going with the goals over two point two five goals, Dan, at um, minus one twenty seven. Um, sticking with the bet that won for me in the in the previous game for Iceland against uh, Israel, which was a crazy match. It ended 4-1, but it could have ended anything. There was a crucial missed penalty for Iceland that would have made it 2-all. Old dog uh, Zahavi scored a penalty, then missed one. And it just proved... I mean, that match went exactly as I thought it would, really. I wasn't ma I wasn't massively confident about that over, but um, it really did come in. And it's because Iceland can't defend very well, and they know they've got to lean on their offence to get them through. And I think they're going to... This is a really... I think Iceland have enjoyed now being the underdog again. They always relished that tag, and then they started to get better, and people expected more from them, and they couldn't produce. Now they're back in this underdog territory. And again, here, everyone's kind of expecting Ukraine to go through. And it's a bit of a shame that they're against Ukraine, because obviously a lot will be wanting Ukraine to go through as well. So there's a lot of sort of good feelings around this game. And I think that could lead to quite an open match. I think Ukraine showed they got goals in them against Bosnia. It was a poor first hour from them, but Bosnia played better than we we, we thought they would in that game. So credit to Bosnia. Iceland and Bosnia, who's better, who's worse? Well, they both played against each other in the qualifying. Both had a win each. It's probably not much in it, but ultimately Ukraine are the better team. They're the highest ranked team in this group in this section by a long way. They've got the extra quality, and I think they'll win the game. Um, but I do like the goals because Iceland will not go down without a fight. I think they can get on the score sheet. Both teams score yes is a massive price here, I think. But I prefer to take the over 2.25 goal line. Um, not that I'm thinking about a half loss here, but uh, you know, it's always nice to have that in your pocket. But I'm thinking Ukraine sort of 3 1, 2 1 territory. They'll have enough to go through, but Iceland will give it a good crack. And this this could be a good watch, you know, on neutral territory. I've said it before, these matches tend to explode sometimes on neutral territory. So let's hope for let's hope for that electric atmosphere and electric performance on the field from both. Uh minus 127 uh for over two and a quarter goals uh in the final playoff game that we're looking at. We've got two friendly picks. We're also co gonna cover off um a couple of the big games as well when it comes to friendly internationals. Uh Norway, Slovakia, first of all, Tuesday, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Steve's got a pick in this one. Uh, Norway minus 134, Slovakia plus 410. Norway lost 2 1 at home to Czechia. Slovakia went down 2 0 at home to Austria. Uh, Steve, what is it with this Norway side? I, I, I dropped on the the, the, uh, the coverage just to watch 20 minutes of it or so. And 
you know, Oscar Bob's playing, Harlan's playing, uh, Erdegaard's playing. I, I don't understand why they're, why they're not in the European Championship finals, let alone getting beat off Jakia at home in a friendly. Well, this is why I added the game. I just wanted to rant about Norway, Dan. Uh, <laughs> I mean, just my head in. I, I, I just, I can't explain why this team doesn't even get close to the championships, let alone qualify for them. And, you know, every, it seems like every time I see it, one of their matches these days, whether it be Nations League or friendlies, they just seem to be well below par. It, it's baffling, isn't it? They, they should be easily beating Czechia at home. You know, I know it's only a friendly, but look at that lineup. It was absurdly good. There's world class players in that lineup, and uh, I just think you know. And I'm going to mention this in a few of the friendlies soon. Um, often teams that have took a bit of criticism in their first match of an international window, the second match they want to prove a point and raise their levels a bit. And I think that could happen with Norway here because all I've seen on Twitter everywhere is you know what's going on with this generation of players. They've got to do better, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They'll be fired up. You know, I know it's only a friendly, but I, I really like over 2.5 goals here at minus 130. Norway could cover it on their own. I mean, who knows what sort of state Haaland's in. Maybe he'll even pull out before this game. But if he's on the field, that's a frightening prospect for any defence, isn't it? And um, he might just want to fill his boots, grab a couple of goals. You know, there's, there's some really, really good talent offensively, especially for Norway. And I think even if... They use some of their bench players. They're more than capable of getting of scoring against this Slovakia team, who not that bad. They just lost against Austria. Um, there's been a record, hasn't there, for fastest international goal in that game, Dan? Um, there was Christoph Baumgartner, six seconds. Six. You know, I really feel for the overbackers there, though, because the match ended under. <laughs> I know it's incredible. <laughs> you, isn't it? it's incredible. <laughs> You're counting your money, aren't you, after six seconds? Oh, yeah. But it yeah. somehow ends under. Anyway, that better not happen here. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Slovakia are actually not too bad. They they are capable of contributing goals a bit. And, and look, the weakness, I've said it for a while, in the Norway team is the defence, is the goalkeeper. So they will get chances and more than likely find a way to get on the score sheet. But I just think Norway will want to fight back here, show what they're made of. And it's about time they put in a convincing performance just to shut up the doubters, really, Dan. And even if they only play sort of at an average level, they're more than capable of scoring, you know, three goals by themselves. But uh, I certainly wouldn't trust them on the money line. You, they're the sort of, you cannot trust Norway to win games, but um, the goals, I definitely think, you know, will come flying here. And um, maybe this golden generation will finally qualify for the next tournament, but um, wouldn't bank on it. Uh, we like over two and a half goals. Yeah, fastest goal for Austria against Slovakia. Crystal Baum got in six seconds. Germany, who did hold the record previously, Lukas Podolski against Ecuador, seven seconds back in 2013. Nearly won it back just an hour or two later uh, when they scored after seven seconds against France in a 2-0 win. Another game that didn't go over is after a goal in the opening seconds. Florian Wirtz with a goal. Brings us nicely on to Germany, Netherlands. Rory's got to play in this Tuesday, 3.45 Eastern. Um, Germany, our favourites, minus 110. Netherlands, plus 255. The Dutch, 4-0 winners over Scotland. Um, I believe that the scoreline flattered the Dutch a little bit, Rory. I don't know if you were across it um, with um, with your Scotland hat on here. But obviously, it was a win nonetheless. But Germany were impressive by all accounts against France. Uh, what's your take here? What's the play? Yeah, I'm going Germany over one and a half goals, and that comes back at minus 114 as it stands. Um, I think even Germany to win is not the worst bet. I think just because it's a friendly, I left that out and went for the for the goals, which are just a touch less um, uh, sort of less profitable, but I, I think probably a little bit safer. And yeah, that Dutch win was obscenely flattering, to be honest. I mean, you can argue that it's it's going to be a different game because Scotland probably sat back a little bit more and, and let the Netherlands play in front of them, whereas Germany will try and take the game to the Netherlands. And that's where the Netherlands were very good against Scotland in that kind of last half hour and um, cutting them up on the on the break and once they'd won that ball back. But but yeah, if it wasn't for, for Reinders, the midfielder, who had a very good game, scored an absolute screamer in the first half that came from nowhere, basically. They weren't really creating too many chances. The Dutch side... And then in the second half, he had a crucial block, which um, deflected a shot wide for Scotland and would have made it 1-1. Scotland had their chances in this game. I think if you look at Germany's record of the last nine games in which they've scored, 
they've scored uh, two or more in eight of them. So that suggests if they can get on the score sheet, they're going to score a few more goals. This is their last home game before they kind of lead up to the Euros. This is, they're going to want to, they've obviously got a couple of friendlies in the lead up, but this is their kind of last chance to, to play in front of their friends, fans before the summer. Tony Kroos is back. I think that's a huge, huge um, point of positive for this Germany side. We saw them be impressive against France. And part of the reason I think Tony Kroos is so big is because he's no nonsense. He does not mind telling his teammates exactly what he thinks of their performance. And he will have standards. And if somebody doesn't meet them, Tony Kroos is going to let you know about it. He raises the level of every side he's in for me. Um, and I think his return could be quite, quite large. And, and talking about the Netherlands a little bit, if you look at their record, they're playing very well. Um, the last three games, I think they're 12 zero on aggregate which suggests that they're they're doing very well they've won six of their last seven but not to uh echo some of my colleagues in spain who, who have a bit, a bit of a bone to pick with ronald kuman it has to be said <laughs> but if you were to delve into his record a little bit more then you might see that perhaps there's a there's some masking of results here if you look at the teams that have a little bit more quality teams that we consider to be top level and maybe you can argue that germany aren't top level anymore because of those results we've seen but they do have that talent, uh, but it's against those sides. It's a 2-1 loss versus France. It's a 3-2 defeat versus Italy, a 4-2 defeat versus Croatia, 4-0 loss versus France. And then that goes right back to the World Cup 2-2 against Argentina, which obviously they did pretty well in. But it suggests that against those top teams, teams that have the quality to punish them. And as I say, Scotland created quite a few chances. And if they had had that quality to punish them, would have scored at least a couple of goals they don't necessarily have the defensive fortitude to, to keep them out. And that's why I like Germany over one and a half goals at minus 114. Yeah, they're they're, 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 they're flat-track bullies, aren't they? Like Netherlands are generally flat-track bullies. And mm. I think I agree with what Rory said here about them. They um, you put them against sort of an average or a poor team and they will rack up the score. They're the sort of side. They're not just happy with 1-0. As soon as they face um, a, a side that's got a decent offensive weapons and firepower, they often get fouled out. So this looks a... Pretty good spot, actually. I think. Good yeah, I like this one. I mean, Tony Cross as well back for the first time in three years. I think it's a massive plus as well. See, I was very nice about Scotland there. Um, unlike Rory, when it comes to England, and, there, and the therefore, difference is... un unlike a certain Irish bookmaker. Did you see their tweet about it? No, I didn't. What did they say? <laughs> well, you better have a look later. Oh, no, 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 they weren't very kind about Scotland. <laughs> I'd the difference is that Scotland don't have things to celebrate, whereas England do actually win things or get far in tournaments. So we have to take our joys <laughs> elsewhere. Uh, uh, because of that, I'm not going to ask Rory about, uh, Rory about the next game, which is England versus Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only going to ask Steve. England versus Belgium. England minus 109, minus money favourites. Just um, Belgium plus 255, Tuesday 345. Uh, Eastern. Steve, you were spot on with the unders play for England against Brazil. You called the game correctly. Very scrappy against Selassal. Belgium, not any better, I don't think, in a, in a draw mm. with Ireland. Are we going in again with the unders? Is it going to be another scrappy game? Have England got a, a point to prove? Have Belgium got a point to prove? What do you think? Well, I, I actually called it spot on. It was probably my best read of the whole season, wasn't it? It went exactly as I foresaw. Um and now I suppose people are after my take on this game and let's see how accurate I am here. And usually what happens with England, the second game of a window like this, is a react. we get a reaction. There's a lot of criticism, a lot of talk about uh, the manager and all that and what players should be playing and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So usually the best play for the next match is actually to look to go with England or the overs. But because there's so many key players missing like Kane and Saka... I don't know. I don't know anymore. Belgium have just had a nil-nil with Ireland. And I mean, when you think about it, what, what the players must have been so depressed going there. Because I mean, Ireland are one of the worst teams in international soccer, aren't they? For I mean, I, I mentioned Wales the other week. Ireland are different level for this. I mean, they're, they're horrific. I mean, why looking at it, I should have just gone on the unders blind on that game. But I, So I think Belgium might be just a bit frustrated and angry and maybe they might try and take it out on England as well. If I was to bet on this one, Dan, I'd be looking at both teams score yes at minus 125. I think, um, you know, after both sides have not scored a goal, they'll want to get on the score sheet. And, um, you know, typically, like I say, we do see a much better version of England after the criticisms come in. There's not been that much criticism, has there? There's been bits and bobs. Because I think because it's Brazil, 
kind of Southgate in England have got away with it a bit. But that isn't a particularly great Brazil team, like I said before. So, um, you know, Belgium, I don't think will be fear in England. And it might be quite a good game. But I don't think I've got the the balls to to stake any hard cash down on this game, mm. Dan, because of what I saw from both. Yeah, well, not to lose your shirt on, so to speak, when it comes <laughs> to England. Um, <laughs> so one more game to cover off. Uh, Spain against Brazil, 4.30 Eastern on Tuesday. Late kickoff back in Madrid, Rory, aren't they, after that sojourn in London for the Columbia game? They are even money favourites to beat Brazil, plus 260. What were the headlines um, back in uh, Madrid uh, for Spain after after that uh, loss at Columbia, you touched on it briefly at the top of the show. I mean, much changed side. W- w- was there anger? Is is there pressure building on De La Fuente here? What's the take at the moment? Yeah, basically that that Colombia wanted this more. That it didn't matter too much to Spain. We'll kind of turn the page and look forward to the next friendly against Brazil, but also the Euros. I don't think um, there was surprisingly, and not to cut off my nose despite my face, but. Uh, uh, yeah, in Spain, surprisingly, a lack of kind of reactionary takes off this uh, game. I think most people were kind of pretty sanguine about it. Um, against Brazil, you're at home, you're at the Bernabeu, obviously. I think that changes things a little bit. They'll need to be a little bit more kind of proactive and a little bit more um, impressive, basically, against Brazil. Um, a Brazil side that, yeah, probably the pressure is a little bit off them again. In terms of kind of where to go and picks, I think this could go one of several ways, to be honest. I... I think Brazil, given the way they played against England, I'm not necessarily sure I like them to beat Spain. Um, and so I think you're trying to leverage that into some value, basically. If you want to go Spain draw plus under three and a half, that's maybe one to look at in the same game parlay. Um, in terms of overs or unders, I wouldn't necessarily be confident calling the money line there. I just, I just don't think you, you've got enough certainty on it. Um, Spain... If you look at the side that they put out, I think there will be a lot of changes. I think Danny Carvajal will be on to combat Vinicius. I think Paul Cubarsi could make his starting debut. And I'm not being funny right now. He's playing as well as anyone else in Spain at centre half. Uh, Nico Williams, I think, will start as well. I think a lot of those players that were on the bench for the previous game will come into the side. And you can kind of see De La Fuente was prioritising this one. So, so yeah, against the Brazil the side that obviously we know is not in full flow obviously bring with them dangers i'd be yeah slightly more inclined to look at kind of under three and a half and then wherever you like the value for this game and um, get on that same game parlay is basically what i'm saying for this yeah i know what you mean spain or brazil one of the two whichever you like but go the under three and a half to to boost up return uh steve thoughts on this one if this was like a world cup game um then i'd be all over the unders This feels like a really tight game, doesn't it? But I just wonder, will Spain have a similar thing to England where they maybe come in for a bit of criticism after the Columbia match and they'll want to prove a point? I don't know. But um, yeah, I was actually looking, and I'm really going a bit off tangent here, at the Copa America groups. We've got Brazil, Colombia, Paraguay and Costa Rica in the same group this this summer. And I'm all over the unders in all their games. I just think those teams at the minute, especially like Colombia, and Brazil are actually, despite a reputation down the years of being really good offensively, at the best at the moment they're at their best defensively and at the back they're really secure. And um, yeah, I'm already look, licking my lips actually at some of these unders in the summer. Um, you know, six pm kickoffs in California and yeah, Paraguay, was, Brazil. But, Paraguay, yeah. Brazil's in Las Vegas, so I think all the money should be on the unders. Yeah, there's a few in Texas as well. I mean, it's gonna be it's gonna be. Um, Hot, I would have thought, in certain mm. states, isn't it? To say the least, for some of those, that's going to be one. Brazil are really tight team, like really well disciplined, but really well organised. And um, I don't think they'll lose to Spain. There you go. Maybe Brazil drawing under three and a half, trying to get that same game party as Rory was was talking about. Or you could just go plain unders at minus 133. That is Tuesday, uh, 4.30 Eastern. Um, best bets before we wrap up. Steve, what's your best play over the course of uh, the final international break of, of the season, the European season, so to speak, Steve? Uh, let's go, I think, Norway, Slovakia. I think Norway were out to prove a point in this game in a friendly. And Rory... Yeah, I'm going Greece. Uh, Greece are a better team than Georgia. Greece will win this, um, and I think they'll go through. 
So that, that's that, that's over two and a half goals. That's Norway, over two, yeah. Or, or yeah. is it over, over, over two? two and a half it is over two and a half. Over two and, 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 and plus one twenty. I should say about Greece to win. And plus, yeah. I mean, Greece. I think that's the biggest play we've got in terms of price. Plus one twenty. I, yeah, Georgia. Georgia. I was very disappointed with. I thought Luxembourg on a different day with a different referee might have won that game. But there you go. Uh, <laughs> that wraps up uh, betting weekly extra time international edition. Plenty to go out globally. Stay across all of our content on our YouTube channel. Many thanks to Steve and Rory from all of us for now. It is goodbye.